oxygenated uh, blood from a parent, uh, instill it into the circulation of the child to allow the heart to be open to repair VSD, uh, and then complete the circuit back to the parent for uh, for further gas exchange. So from, from that sort of biologic basis, again, there's a lot of steps being skipped here and a lot of fast forward, um, but Gibbons invented this sort of first heart lung machine that facilitated what we would think of as modern cardiac or open heart surgery. And from there, a lot of technology and material design has sort of developed into what a membrane oxygenator or cardiopulmonary bypass machine might look like to allow us to perform uh, open heart surgery. Uh, and in parallel, it's developed as a therapy, as a form of life support for critically ill patients in intensive care. So this is, again, not a dissimilar idea what this machine is doing compared to this machine, uh, but some of the technology and material design and sort of computer control, the therapy has evolved in the background, but really they're all sort of performing the same task, and that's allowing gas exchange and a pump to move blood around. And there's, there's a sort of modern attempt at ipodification of this type of technology to miniaturize it and put it in this small sort of briefcase size package to uh, allow this therapy to use be used more efficiently uh, when you're thinking about transporting critically ill patients and having the the life support machine be more streamlined or bring it into austere environments for field retrieval of critically ill patients away from uh, a major hospital. Um, so there's a, a very fascinating history behind the design and development of this technology. At the end of the day, in the world of critical care, if we're talking about ECMO, we'd be talking about one of two things. One is VV or venovenous ECMO, which means that we're draining deoxygenated venous blood from the body, oxygenating it through a membrane lung and returning it to the venous circulation. Or VA ECMO, which is venoarterial ECMO, which means draining deoxygenated blood from the venous circulation, oxygenating it, and then returning it to the arterial circulation. There's ways to make this a lot more complicated, but foundationally, that's really just what we were talking about when we consider one of those two therapies. Um, so talking about both of these sort of in series, but what is VV ECMO? So again, we're, we're removing deoxygenated venous blood, performing gas exchange through a membrane lung. So adding oxygen to deoxygenated blood, removing CO2 and returning it back into the venous circulation from where it came. So this is really a form of lung bypass. So if we think about, you know, traditional gas exchange, the deoxygenated blood from your organs goes to the right side of your heart, gets pumped to your lungs to become oxygenated, goes back to the left side of the heart and pumps the oxygenated blood back into your organs. If we're in a situation where your lung function is severely compromised and it's not adequately performing those duties of gas exchange, of oxygenation and clearance of carbon dioxide, then addition of this membrane lung will allow the oxygenation to happen outside of the lungs and return that oxygenated blood back to the right side of the heart. Um, and then there's oxygenated blood actually being delivered through the lungs back to the left-sided circulation. And if we look sort of uh, mechanistically at how that's happening, we have a blender that's sort of blending some fraction of air and oxygen and very similar to a ventilator. So is the gas being delivered to the lungs through the ventilator 100% oxygen? Is it 50% oxygen? Very same thing. And that's placed into the membrane lung, which just allows a semi-permeable membrane between the bloodstream and this fresh gas flow, uh, which will allow this um, exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide to happen at that interface. Uh, typical VV ECMO patient would be someone like this with ARDS, with the sort of really bad heterogeneous infiltrates, very challenging to ventilate patient. And there are multiple different ways that we can sort of connect the plumbing of the circuit. The specifics of that, not tremendously important, but some form of femoral venous or internal jugular venous access to drain the blood and return it. And it can be done either sort of with two large single lumen cannulas or one larger double lumen cannula, which if you look at it in cross section, has one large tube that has both the drainage and the return of the oxygenated blood uh, through a single access. Uh, in parallel to that, so VA ECMO or veno arterial ECMO will remove the deoxygenated venous blood and then perform that gas exchange in the membrane lung, but return it back to the arterial circulation. Uh, and that really is sort of bypass for both the heart and the lungs. And again, if we're looking at that same sort of model of the deoxygenated blood going to the lungs, becoming oxygenated, returning to the body. If you're in a situation in severe cardiogenic shock where your forward flow from the heart is also extremely poor, uh, and your native lung function may or may not be uh, affected by that at the same time, what we end up doing is draining that deoxygenated blood 
from the body, oxygenating it and returning it directly to the organs through the arterial circulation. And the heart sometimes has very little native function at the uh, at the onset of the need for VA ECMO. So we're really sort of excluding largely both the heart and the lung function um, through that type of setup. Uh, two main ways that can be done either centrally, which is very common after cardiac surgery or post cardiotomy need for VA ECMO or peripherally through the femoral vessels. So femoral arterial and venous access. And really those patients, uh, would be the ones that you look at that have sort of severe ventricular failure. In this case, an echo of someone with severe biventricular failure, uh, where their hemodynamic monitors are suggestive of hypotension that likely looks, um, and smells exactly like cardiogenic shock. So poor, peripheral organ and tissue oxygenation and perfusion on the basis of poor pump failure. Um, but what these two things have in common is that we use some form of a pump to move the blood around and this membrane lung where the blood gas interface happens uh, to allow that circuit to remove that deoxygenated blood and then return it to the patient in the arterial and venous circulation. This is kind of what one of the machines will look like. So you can see the, the tubing with the dark red deoxygenated blood going through the membrane lung and then being moved through with the pump. And then there's the, the console and the heat exchanger attached to it on the stand. There are more streamlined versions of it that are uh, a little bit more sort of efficient in their setup and more compact as well, which can sometimes make transport a little bit easier. Um, but that's ultimately kind of what the technology is doing and how it works. So if that's kind of what the setup is like, who should we be referring for consideration for ECMO as a therapy? So, Ultimately, the, the guiding principle is that it would be a patient in severe acute heart or lung failure with one of the following destinations in mind. So it's either will be functioning as a bridge to ultimate uh, native organ recovery, bridge to receiving a transplant, so heart or lung transplant, bridge to another bridge, so someone in heart failure that might get a more durable, implantable mechanical support device, or uh, sort of temporizing as a bridge to a decision about what you might do next. And if you have someone that's an extremist and end-stage organ failure that you don't expect recovery, wouldn't be wise to add it as another machine on the way out as the patient has sort of an unrecoverable trajectory. So we should be anticipating some form of recovery or destination treatment to allow stabilization or recovery of their organ failure. So as a guiding principle, um, from a global consensus pattern, the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, or ELSO, uh, has a set of guidelines for consideration uh, of both VV and VA ECMO. And I think important to keep in mind that these are sort of guidelines. It's not um, a strict objective hard indication contraindication. Um, but if you look at their indications and contraindications for adult VV ECMO, um, the specific clinical conditions that are usually involved in referral uh, and cannulation for VV ECMO are ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, from things like viral bacterial pneumonia, from aspiration pneumonia, aspiration pneumonitis, acute eosinophilic, eosinophilic pneumonia, uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or pulmonary hemorrhage, interestingly, which seems a bit counterintuitive sometimes in a therapy that requires anticoagulation, but can be used quite successfully for that. Um, patients with severe refractory asthma, significant lung injury from thoracic trauma, um, severe inhalational injuries, either sort of chemical or thermal, large bronchopleural fistulas, uh, where patients are sort of further compromised by positive pressure ventilation uh, and patients that are peri-lung transplants, uh, either with sort of failing native lungs as a bridge to transplant or with primary lung graft dysfunction after lung transplant. Um, the sort of physiologic indications that are sort of classically described from some of the previous trials are patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure uh, that have a PF ratio of less than 80 after your best attempt at optical medical management. Um, and that really includes sort of climbing the ladder that we usually consider for evidence-based therapies. Um, so high PEEP, low tidal volume ventilation as per the sort of ARDSNET protocol, attempts at proning, neuromuscular blockade. And if you're trying those things and they're not working, then another thing to consider that's in the sort of evidence generating spectrum would be considering VV ECMO for their hypoxemia in that patient population. Uh, but also less often considered as patients that have hypercapnic respiratory failure uh, so severe respiratory acidosis, despite your best attempts at ventilator titration. And that can be in the absence of concomitant hypoxemia. Um, and in fact, the uh, membrane oxygenators are more efficient at clearing CO2 than they are infusing oxygen. Uh, 
Um, so that is another strong indication for referral and consideration. And then again, ventilator support is a bridge to lung transplantation or primary graft dysfunction after you have a lung transplant, which again, less, less relevant outside of the lung transplant center of Toronto, but also just something to be aware of. Um, when we think about contraindications, so is there really an underlying organ dysfunction that's going to give them a poor prognosis at baseline, or do they have a very dismal neurologic prognosis are kind of the main things to consider. So previous known CNS hemorrhage or traumatic brain injury, significant central nervous system injury, let's say like a stroke, irreversible and incapacitating central nervous system pathology. Otherwise, patients with systemic bleeding uh, who would bleed more with anticoagulation or other contraindications to anticoagulation. Uh, patients that are severely immunosuppressed that might be at significant risk of opportunistic infection. Um, older age is always one, but it's really hard to use that uh, as a strict criteria in the sort of age ain't nothing but a number type of concept. You know, there's 65 year olds that look 95 and there are 95 year olds that look 30. Uh, they can't really stick to a specific age as a cutoff. Um, mechanical ventilation for more than seven days, which is a very important thing to consider. Um, Ultimately, this is a surrogate for the fact that one of the main benefits of venovenous ECMO and sort of severe acute lung failure is that it helps us prevent further ventilator-induced lung injury. So uh, avoiding a prolonged pre-referral timeline of mechanical ventilation uh, is just a surrogate for that when you look at the contraindications. So in patients where you're sort of struggling to ventilate them and they have severe ARDS with a chest X-ray that might look like this, you've tried neuromuscular blockade and prone positioning, still having significant challenges with hypoxemia, hypercapnia. Those are the types of patients to consider. Uh, again, when we think about who should be referred for venoarterial you know, arterial ECMO, these are generally patients that are in cardiogenic shock uh, or have some form of primary heart failure. Um, and again, the ELSO guidelines for VA ECMO, if we review them, there have been multiple different trials in the past and not all of them using ECMO as a therapy that have different sort of physiologic criteria for cardiogenic shock. Um, more recently, the SKY classification or stages of cardiogenic shock, this consensus statement that came out in 2019, tried to frame this as this nice sort of ABCDE mnemonic of at risk, beginning, classic, deteriorating, and extremists in terms of the stages of cardiogenic shock and also have it broken down into very easy to sort of understand and frame your understanding of those stages by physical exam, biochemical markers, and hemodynamics. And these are sort of working their way into some of the considerations for uh, a framework uh, or consideration for possible referral for ECMO. But ultimately the uh, you know central source of pathology is always gonna be some form of cardiogenic shock. And these darker, gray circles here are sort of the classic indications. So acute myocardial infarction, myocarditis, often viral myocarditis, um, post-cardiac arrest or post-heart transplant, bad patients, um, post-cardiotomy failure after cardiac surgery or hypothermia with cardiac instability. But other, I think more recent, less classical situations where patients have had success in isolated cases and case series uh, where VA ECMO has been used as acute pulmonary embolus. And I think there's a number of uh, situations where we've used that successfully as rescue at LHSC in the last year. Uh, trauma, uh, postpartum acute cardiomyopathy um, from things like amniotic fluid embolus or just idiopathic peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, certain drug intoxications like extreme calcium channel and beta blocker overdoses. Um, patients with sepsis with terrible septic cardiomyopathy. Uh, arrhythmic storms, or sometimes backup support for certain interventional cardiology procedures. Um, again, the sort of consideration of this therapy early is another hallmark of the recommendations from this document in line with sort of the VV ECMO guidelines as well. V ECMO should be considered within six hours of occurrence of cardiogenic shock that's refractory to conventional pharmacologic and fluid therapy. Uh, with patients that have a reversible etiology or eligible for some sort of alternative cardiocirculatory assistance, like other form of mechanical support or heart transplant. Um, they, they shouldn't have any contraindications, and there's some sort of anatomic and physiologic contraindications like severe aortic regurgitation or aortic insufficiency, where if you're sort of using a machine to push blood backwards towards the heart, if your aortic valve is not working, the heart will then distend and become dramatically injured by that. Um, but a poor life expectancy or severe liver disease, acute brain injury, immunocompromise, uh, those are part of the exclusion criteria in the same way that they were for VV ECMO. Um, again, the contraindications uh, that are objectively defined in this document are both sort of anatomic and physiologic, but if you are uh, 
have severe peripheral vascular disease to the point where you can't get the device in, if your aortic valve is not functional to the point where countercurrent blood flow will be injurious, or you have an overall poor life expectancy from some fixed anatomic or physiologic end stage disease, uh, or reason for poor neurologic prognosis, those are all generally contraindications. But again, I think the North Star, if we're thinking about a patient that'd be appropriate to refer to in the same way that you have that horrible chest x-ray in a patient not responsive to proning, if we're still having this terrible looking point of care ultrasound at the bedside of our patient that's on 11 different IV pumps that are trying to manage their cardiogenic shock and they remain hypotensive and in shock, those are the types of patients to consider early. The next question is, you know, why does it work and what is the physiologic basis for this and how does it help as a form of life support? And is there evidence to support it or is this just sort of an expensive thing that we're doing just because? Um, so like I've mentioned earlier, um, VV ECMO is helpful for these patients primarily because it minimizes ventilator-induced lung injury. Um, and we know that in, uh, in patients with significant lung disease, we're at risk of things like barotrauma, volutrauma, atelectrauma, diaphragm myotrauma, oxygen toxicity. Uh, and in patients that were really struggling to ventilate, VV ECMO can really help facilitate lung rest. Um, and if we look at, again, the evidence that we've generated in terms of protecting lungs in patients with lung failure, um, the ARDSNET trial in the year 2000 showed that uh, low volume, low pressure ventilation decreased mortality versus the traditional approach. Proceva that we know about as well to provide a objective basis for considering prone ventilation in these people. I showed ventilation in the prone position decreases mortality versus the traditional supine approach as per their protocol. Um, more recently, things like the driving pressure starts to show us an inflection point where if that delta P starts to become higher and higher, we see a fairly strong inflection that that begins to represent more and more injurious lung ventilation uh, that increases in hospital mortality for these patients. So ultimately, the, the sum forces of sort of overall biotrauma and lung trauma that can happen as a result of injurious mechanical ventilation, in some ways, in certain patients can be avoided uh, by turning on an extracorporeal circuit to provide gas exchange, and to a large degree, turning off the ventilator to avoid further injurious ventilation to those patients. And if we look at our own local guidelines of how to ventilate someone who is on VV ECMO, we can look at, I think, most shockingly, the sort of tidal volumes are what we would classify as ultra low lung protective ventilation strategy between zero and four milligrams per kilogram. We've seen patients with extremely poor lung compliance and severe ARDS getting, you know, functionally almost just like the dead space in and out with every breath that they're getting from the ventilator during the most extreme phase of their VV ECMO run. And that really, again, is just a surrogate that we're not just going to let the lungs sit there and collapse. We want to cycle them during the inspiratory and expiratory phase but they're really participating very minimally in gas exchange at that point due to the severe extent of their lung disease. And we're really just allowing the circuit to take over the job of gas exchange while the lungs heal themselves. So our primary goal using this as a therapy is not necessarily just to sort of supercharge the blood with oxygen and clean the carbon dioxide if we can, but it's to prevent further lung injury on the basis of ventilator induced lung injury uh, and await lung recovery. Uh, and again, I think Sometimes the most challenging thing is to avoid complications that are iatrogenic related to both the circuit and, and patient related complications. And these complications include both bleeding and clotting, um, difficulties with mobility, and literally everything else you can possibly think of. So if we look at this nice summary slide from a publication from Dan Brody, the types of complications that are often present in patients receiving VV ECMO include intracranial hemorrhage or ischemic stroke, ventilator-associated uh, ventilator pneumonia or pneumothorax, um, DVTs and PEs, renal failure requiring some form of renal replacement therapy, failure of the membrane lung or thrombosis of the circuit or pump failure requiring exchange of the circuit, and then uh, hemorrhage, either gastrointestinal, spontaneous bleeding at cannulation sites, um, outside of intracranial hemorrhage, uh, hemolysis of the blood trauma through the circuit, and the need for circuit changes. So many things can go wrong, and part of the um, success that you build around successfully managing a patient on ECMO is avoiding these complications as much as it is supporting them to allow recovery for their lungs. Uh, the next question is, is there evidence to support this? And this has proven to be an extremely challenging thing to study. Um, so historically, I think many of us know about the CSER trial from 2009, where uh, referral for consideration for VD ECMO resulted in increased survival versus conventional ventilator management. 
But interestingly, as per that protocol, that was referral to an ECMO capable center and not necessarily everyone transferred there uh, received VV ECMO as a therapy. Uh, so there may be some signal that, you know, uh, in a, an expert acute lung injury center that's capable of offering ECMO may actually be, you know, where the value is and not necessarily ECMO itself in isolation. Um, the, uh, the Aeolia trial as well from 2018, um, comparing VV ECMO to sort of usual ARDS therapy did not show a significant reduction in 60 day mortality. Uh, there was a signal that was very close to benefit that people like to fixate on, but I think statistically remains non-significant regardless of your emotional feelings about that. But uh, interestingly, 28% of the patients in the control group did cross over to ECMO for refractory hypoxemia. So that is sort of interesting and sort of hypothesis generating for further study. But regardless of the fact that we don't necessarily have a very uh, strong global consensus slam dunk RCT level amount of evidence to support it. If we look at registry data from the extra Royal Life Support Organization globally, if we look at the annual amount of respiratory adult ECMO runs between 1990 and 2020, over 30 years, it's gone from 20 a year to almost 8,000 a year. Um, so clearly people are seeing some benefit to this therapy that we haven't necessarily been able to fully demonstrate in the context of a clinical trial. But uh, I think Again, part of this comes from the fact that a lot of critical care literature does lump a lot of patients in that are very heterogeneous. And if we start to extract some of the patients that do well from some of them that don't, uh, if you look at patients with aspiration pneumonia, the survival is 77%, uh, all the way down to patients that have viral pneumonia or other respiratory etiologies where the survival is closer to 57 or 59% mm -hmm. based on this registry data. Um, so really the underlying etiology as, with, as within many things in critical care does influence the survival of the patient, um, which is important to consider in the context of them all receiving the same kind of therapy. Uh, again, I think more recently, a thing that we think about is the, the respiratory failure pandemic that we've all just been through very recently. There have been a number of studies mid pandemic looking at the overall mortality of use in VV ECMO for patients with severe COVID-19 pneumonia that were refractory to conventional um, sort of ARDS management of prone ventilation and, and lung protective ventilation strategies. And the mortality in those studies has been ranged anywhere from 30% to 54%. Uh, but the results have generally been quite good. If you look at the um, extracorporeal life support registry data, again, for this, there have been about 17 and a half thousand confirmed cases of COVID-19 that have received ECMO. And if we look at their overall chart of outcomes, their mortality in general is around 50%. Uh, but of the people that have survived their ECMO run, we can see that a significant portion of those were discharged from hospital, um, many of them home or to a rehab center, some of them to a long-term acute care setting, uh, and then others to a sort of home hospital for further rehabilitation. Um, so certainly they're alive and functional, some of them obviously not back to their baseline, uh, but the same can be said for many patients in critical care in general. Uh, shifting over to, I think, the underlying basis of the why for VA ECMO. Um, but similarly, patients in cardiogenic shock that have some sort of primary cardiac insult, whether it's sort of classically a myocardial infarction, um, right and possibly biventricular failure as a consequence of severe acute pulmonary embolus. Um, ultimately, those patients will have a decrease in their cardiac output. Their blood pressure will decrease. Um, the vasoconstriction that can occur as a compensatory mechanism from that. Uh, can cause injurious increase in their afterload and a failing heart, which further decreases their cardiac output. And this sort of death spiral of cardiogenic shock can then sort of spring off from there as a consequence of their decreased organ perfusion uh, and the ischemic and inflammatory cascade that can happen from there, which again has a, a further negative feedback loop to your overall heart function in the context of your cardiogenic shock. Uh, and if we look at, uh, again, the classic model of acute myocardial infarction in patients in cardiogenic shock, the more organ failures you have and the more organ dysfunctions that you have in the context of that severe acute failing heart, the higher your in-hospital mortality is. And that's been well demonstrated in a number of different studies. So in those patients uh, with very poor native heart function that's not perfusing their organs, um, if we're using this sort of pump oxygenator combination as a form of extracorporeal life support, you can have a patient alive with really no pulsatility from their native heart whatsoever. Um, it's not necessarily a situation that you want to keep going for indefinite periods of time, but sometimes when they're an extremist and acutely presenting, they're really getting almost no native forward flow from their heart. Uh, 
Uh, and once they get their bridge to ultimate treatment or recovery, then that can sort of slowly recover over time as their native heart function recovers. But it can be very impressive to see the degree of sort of deranged human physiology that you can support with that type of therapy. Another nice visual of the concept of that is this patient who's had a CT with arterial phase contrast while on VA ECMO. And if we see the ascending aorta here, there's really no contrast in that whatsoever, reflective of this being the sort of region of native cardiac output that's reaching the body. And this contrast uh, enhanced blood is coming through the ECMO circuit itself. Mm -hmm. So clearly it's responsible for perfusing all the major abdominal organs in the lower body and reaching up to the level of the arch vessels. So at least partially perfusing the upper body and left arm and part of the brain as well. That's a fairly dramatic visual to, again, uh, pair with that fairly impressive flat art line tracing on this monitor. Um, and again, is there evidence to support this as a therapy that we can consider? Uh, this was an interesting review from cardiovascular revascularization medicine, which is again, largely sort of a myocardial infarction, interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery context. But if they look, they examined the 16 year national trends in the United States in the use and outcomes of VA ECMO and cardiogenic shock. And between 2002 and 2018, uh, the use of ECMO increased basically 300% over that time, uh, while the mortality decreased significantly. Uh, again, with a review like this at a population level, there's an enormous risk for bias of reasons why that might be. Uh, but certainly the use of it as a therapy and the overall mortality has, uh, has improved significantly over the last 20 or so years. Um, the uh, group in Toronto was actually involved in uh, this large systematic review and meta-analysis, looking at the impact of etiology uh, of outcomes in patients receiving VA ECMO in over 30,000 patients in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation. Um, but again, as you, you know, if you lump everyone together that receives VA ECMO, you may have some fairly dismal results that don't look tremendously impressive. But if we start to stratify it on the basis of the reason that they needed the therapy to begin with, um, the short-term mortality in those patients uh, can be, again, fairly sort of acceptable and worthwhile in the context of the critically ill patients that we're used to treating on a daily basis. But on the best end of the spectrum, patients that require rescue post-heart transplant with graft dysfunction have a 35% mortality when they, again, in the context of their systematic review and meta-analysis. At the other end of the spectrum, patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest would do worse, and there's a lot of reasons why we can consider why that spectrum exists. But then on the in-between patients with acute uh, cardiopulmonary collapse from pulmonary embolus, the results are fairly reasonable with an overall mortality of 52%. Um, so we really want to stratify it on the basis of, of why they needed the therapy to begin with, more than just thinking about, you know, does this work as a machine or not? Um, so ultimately, if that's how it works and why we do it and what the, the justification or evidence behind the therapy might be. I think the next question when we think about, you know, the referral centers that exist and patients that want to, or uh, centers that want to consider patients for referral, when should we refer patients? So uh, very thankfully, Critical Care Services Ontario has a set of ECMO consultation guidelines, which if you're not aware of, I can draw to your attention at the Critical Care Services Ontario website. Uh, but it's a very well-designed document that's actually uh, currently undergoing uh, a revision this year, uh, or I guess next year, um, at some point in 2024, and the working group has been assembled to review and update these guidelines, uh, especially to contextualize some of the things that have been learned uh, with the use of VV ECMO during COVID. Um, but it does split it into sort of respiratory and cardiac reasons for referral. Uh, so for respiratory failure, you, again, very similar to some of the things that were mentioned in those ELSO guidelines, but consider ECMO for patients with, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome or hypoxemic respiratory failure, patients with isolated hypercapnic respiratory failure, uh, bridge to lung transplant or patients with failing lung transplants, uh, as well as severe status asthmaticus, um, you should avoid considering ECMO in patients with hard contraindications of end-stage malignancy, end-stage organ failures, uh, prolonged CPR without adequate tissue perfusion, uh, known severe brain injuries or chronic pulmonary hypertension, uh, or any non-recoverable advanced comorbidity or terminal malignancy that might make their overall prognosis dire uh, outside of the context of their acute lung failure. Relative contraindications, again, are related to their anticoagulation, advanced age, obesity, but those are sort of to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, as well as pre-existing end-stage renal disease. 
Uh, and they do have this uh, well-designed chart of mild, moderate, severe ARDS and recommendations for interventions for these, uh, which we're all very familiar with. But if we look more towards the severe end of the ARDS spectrum, uh, at the very bottom, you can look at the sort of hypoxemic and hypercapnic parameters, uh, where if those patients are being considered for lung protective ventilation by the ARSNET protocol, for proning, for neuromuscular blockade, you fail to have results with all of those things and consider to have refractory hypoxemia or hypercapnia, we can consider referral for potential ECMO for those patients. Again, for cardiac collapse, they, they do also have local CCSO guidelines for considerations for referral as well. Uh, and again, these are all very similar to the um, indications for referral that were outlined on the, uh, the ELSO guidelines document, which informed a lot of these. Uh, and again, very similar uh, reasons to not consider ECMO for these people, end-stage uh, pre-existing organ failures, malignant disease, um, prognosis uh, of some organ system or anatomic or phys uh, physiologic pathology that's poor, uh, you know, in isolation uh, outside of the context of their acute heart or lung failure. And then some of those anatomic and physiologic criteria that might make it unsafe, like having an aortic dissection unrepaired, having severe peripheral vascular disease, having uh, aortic regurgitation or aortic insufficiency. Uh, and then again, relative uh, contraindications being uh, any sort of contraindication, anticoagulation, advanced stage or obesity uh, or pre-existing end stage renal disease. Um, I think the next question that comes up very often uh, is how, um, so how do we get these patients to LHSC for consideration of ECMO or whatever your local ECMO center might be for anyone outside of the Southwestern Ontario LHSC region. Um, and I think very broadly, just to consider patients who are sick on a context of alive to dead and the various shades of critical illness that happen in between, there's a window where patients are unwell and safe to transport. And then it becomes a, a window where they're so unwell that they're no longer safe to transport from hospital to hospital. And on one other end of the spectrum, it's patients that are an extremists that are extremely unwell that would be reasonable candidates to consider for VV or VA ECMO that are appropriate ECMO candidates. And those two things do not overlap 100%. Um, so ultimately, uh, in the absence of having a sort of cannulation transport team currently um, that can go out and cannulate patients at another hospital and retrieve them to our center, Always, uh, I think, wise to consider a phone call early while we're still in the safe to transport window where you're maybe considering that they might head in that direction or want to have a discussion about it early. Because there are cases where sometimes patients become so unwell that we lose the window for transport, which can happen. Um, and again, sort of, if you want to take stock of, you know, is this patient a reasonable ECMO candidate or not? very reasonable just to review the CCSO ECMO consultation guidelines um, as a refresher. Uh, and obviously, if you're trying to get in touch with somebody, then getting in touch with us through critical uh, is the best way to go about it. Um, but I think if I had one piece of advice to give when it comes to the how, uh, don't be afraid to call early because the worst thing that would happen is say like, maybe not right now, but in the future, if these objective parameters are met or consideration for just transferring patients early to say that we acknowledge there may be potential decompensation or not but the safest thing to do would be to transfer them early uh, before we lose that safe window for transport. Um, acknowledging that I have seen a couple of questions pop up in the chat. Um, I think that was the bulk of what I wanted to review. Um, and okay, good, that's just from Anton looking for a survey. Uh, that's great. But I just wanted to have a pause for questions that anyone might have uh, about, again, any of the, the who, what, when, where, why, and how uh, that we've reviewed when it comes to, to ECMO in the Southwestern Ontario region. Hey, John, can you hear us over here in the conference room? Yes, I can, Rob. Great. We've now been joined by Neil, as well as uh, Scott and myself. So we have so many questions. We're kind of, I feel like the moderator of a session. I don't want to leave you. May I ask a few others get their sort of the thoughts together? Um, my first one is very boring, very specific. But, you know, the hospital for sick children has had a cannulation transport team recmo for the decades and decades. Um, do, you, uh, do you know... Um, does the GTA, TGH, they have an adult corollary as well, a transport and cannulation ECMO service? Uh, they do, yes. And do you have any sense, just for those on the call, like how frequently it's used, what their scope is, like how many per year kind of thing? I'm just thinking just, just to give us a very, very 
you know, bird's eye view of what that service looks like? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I actually don't have granular objective data about how many patients that they sort of cannulate at the other hospital and return to TGH. Um, I know it's a service that they offer. Um, obviously, they're the largest center in Ontario when it comes to volume, uh, and they have a large volume of expertise. Uh, and I think also they're when it comes to anything, if you're comparing your department of surgery, usually to the UHN, their their resources always end up having to be, you know, the largest based on their size and their their referral patterns and their uh, their patient population that they're treating. Um, so they definitely are capable of a larger number of that than anyone else really is in the province of Ontario. But I don't have any specific numbers to give you about that. Yeah, Neil and I just are talking about it in the side, but uh, yeah, I, it's it's a mystery to us too. I I, I remember we were talking about we had a a young guy in Bay 3, probably 10 years ago now, but they brought the ECMO bus for him and took him he back to Canada Toronto. Here, they can not here, and they, but they transported him on ECMO, yeah. ECMO bus, and he yeah. survived and stuff. Yeah. So I know it exists, and, but you're right, John, it's, a, it's still out of a gray area or a black box for us. They don't go outside either. of Toronto to Canada. Not really? typically. John? John, you'll find the deal. They will definitely come here for pediatric patients. Um, and yeah. Yeah. I have not been part of any context of cases where they have had to come here specifically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And again, obviously, since it's something that we can offer here, the, the number one situation that I could think of is if there's a patient that was uh, a candidate for lung transplantation that happened to be in our hospital that needed as a bridge to lung transplantation, that would be kind of the num number one thing. But as a center that offers mechanical support and heart transplantation for people with acute cardiac failure, there usually wouldn't be a need for the Toronto people to come here. Right. And I see in the chat, Anton did a bit of research with those guys, those folks, and he definitely has um, has some data he can share with us, which is cool. My only other, uh, as I'm waiting, I'm hoping others on the call have some questions. Uh, here, you know, we got one from, uh, oh, just, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to answer your question, but there's a, a question in the chat from one of our Barry intensivists that says the majority of ECMO folks are Canada in Barry, uh, but that's the farthest north. It's kind of like, I guess, um, like the go train. If you, if you can't get a go train, you can't get an ECMO circuit. Um, <laughs> um, no, my, my next comment, I, I don't know if it, it helps others to just sort of think of questions they have. It's more of a comment than a question, but I just wanted to quote Dr. Ian Malcolm uh, from uh, the great film Jurassic Park. When I said, looking at your data, it's clear that we as the sort of medical scientists have answered the question whether we can do ECMO. We definitely can. Uh, the question we're still trying to figure out is whether we should and, and who should get a like your talk said. So it's a cool time to be in critical care because this is we're in the, we're in this gap between the two goalposts of definitely being good at doing it um, and then trying to figure out you know being good at deciding when to do it. And that's such an important time for all of us to have these rounds and have these discussions because it's always going to be nuanced. And it's always going to be um, like we can't say it doesn't exist. We can't say it's impossible. It's definitely possible, but um, but what's the best way to deploy it is such a such a like living, breathing question that changes every day. And, uh, and it's folks like you and these talks and these rounds that are gonna help us shape that for our region and for the whole world. So, thanks, John. Hey, John. Hello. Hi, hey, John. Um, there's no doubt that if you wanna make yourself, you put healthy patients on ECMO. And I mean, if you talk to people at UHN, they brag so much, we're the biggest, we're the best, we do so many. Well, and I'm, I'm not totally sure that if you ask them, they don't even think there's equipoise here. They think this is a required therapy that you must be doing. And then they prove themselves to be helpful, useful, and relevant by potentially putting any and everyone on the therapy. And I think you'll lose credibility if you do that. Uh, so maybe a comment on that. And my other question is, we all know that when it comes to um, devices, uh, the way that generally the core see these things is you need, you need uh, consent to withdraw a device. And what is your thought on um, when you offer this therapy and then the patient or the family changes their mind and never wants to come off the therapy? I know there's some places that try contracts and things like that. It's a scarce resource. It's, it's not, you know, limitless. And we have to be careful that when we put people on this therapy, that we have a plan for how long and a way to get them off the therapy if it, if it's deemed to not work. 
Yeah, uh, those are two excellent points, Scott. I think uh, to your first Can one. Can you say that again, John? Yeah, uh, two excellent points. Um, the, uh, to your first one, um, I think my experience in other hospitals and other countries, not just the United States, uh, and in other healthcare systems, I think you're exactly right. Uh, you know, there are different thresholds and different incentives uh, in the absence of something that's as objective as a well-constructed randomized control trial to sometimes offer therapy. Because you can very easily make your outcomes look much better if you're only treating patients that are healthier. And you, there's a lot of great literature about this in the orthopedic surgery literature that if you're only doing, you know, healthy young athletes that all of the orthopedic surgeries you do are going to have outstanding outcomes. And if you're doing a lot of arthroplasty and like elderly, frail, diabetic patients, your outcomes will be much worse. But someone has to be treating the elderly, frail, diabetic patients. And I think a lot of centers want to declare themselves centers of excellence on the basis of their results without disclosing, you know, the patient population that they're treating in that regard. And I have seen people at other centers that I've done electives and experiences at, uh, you know, have some form of uh, you know, uh, code ECMO, where the ECMO team shows up. And by the time they've arrived and sort of brought their equipment, they don't really meet physiologic criteria anymore. And they would just do it anyway, because there are some form of incentives outside of necessarily what the patient needs, whether it's monetary or whether it's academic or whether it's clinical, that might motivate them to do that. Uh, so I certainly have seen versions of that that don't necessarily have the, is this the right thing for the patient driving the decision being made? And or people just believe so strongly in it that they think that people that are only sort of moderately unwell should be getting ECMO anyway. But there is definitely a large variability in practice, which again, I think to Dr. Lieber's point, it's an exciting time because there's not necessarily, uh, you know, a concrete set in stone set of guidelines about how to use it. And that's always very exciting in the process of discovery. But I think it also is a, is a call for, you know, thoughtfulness and responsibility when we're considering patients for a therapy like that. Um, I think to your second point about the end of life care and withdrawal of life support, uh, extremely important. And I think uh, there's a lot of good sort of moral distress adjacent literature about this uh, in critical care publications and in nursing journals as well. Uh, and I have seen patients that are sort of on ECMO for again, over a hundred days. And as soon as you turn the circuit off, they just start to suffocate and they just have, they're sort of driven into a wedge with a road to nowhere. And those are very complicated end of life discussions. Uh, and I have seen many different approaches to it, uh, whether it's sort of like a um, immediate involvement of the palliative care and ethics team of the hospital at the time of ethics, uh, at the time of ECMO consultation to have them involved in a multidisciplinary discussion. I've seen people, uh, you know, include things like contracts to say that if you acknowledge that this is something that we're advising you might be helpful, I want you to also acknowledge that I will be responsible in a time to tell you when we've reached the end of the road and it's no longer helpful and it's now part of prolonging this patient's natural dying process. I don't think there's one right answer, but I think those are all very important things to consider at the time of consultation uh, is you know, a thoughtful review of the patient's appropriateness and their candidacy and their potential for overall recovery, but then also to be objective about what the timeline for your next family meeting might be or when is enough enough at, as much as it is to say that this might be something that will help. Um, again, nobody has a, a perfect answer to that. Otherwise, everyone would all be doing the same thing. But I think it's, uh, you know, as important a part of the consultation process as the physiologic basis and criteria that I talked about. So I'm glad that you brought that up. John, do you ask questions geared at informing yourself in terms of not specifically saying, are you the kind of family that would never let me say the end is here, but questions geared towards acquiring that information? And would you reject the family if they say, we want everything done forever, no matter what, we'll never give up. If they said that, um, would that dissuade you uh, from offering it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think thankfully I have not personally been involved in a situation like that yet because that can often be very ethically challenging. But I've, my immediate gut reaction to that exact phrase that you've mentioned would be that maybe this isn't the right thing to consider because I'm worried about the injury this might cause this patient 
if they're subjected to this forever because they have a window for recovery. And once you pass the window for recovery, you're artificially prolonging the dying process, which is a phrase that I've taken from your end of life care discussions with people as one of your trainees. Uh, but I think I would absolutely fixate very strongly on the fact that at some point we're going to start causing harm. And the most important part of our job is harm minimization as physicians, as part of the Hippocratic Oath. So I, I would absolutely not have any hesitations about um, being skeptical about the value of offering it in a patient whose family has values the likes of which you describe. Yeah, yeah, you know it's going to happen next week, right? Yes, uh, I'll, uh, I'll call <laughs> you when it happens. You can help me. Out. John, can I, Dr. Lando, may, can, can I just make a comment on that note? Yes, please. Hi, it's Karen Bosma. Um, Scott raises a really interesting point, and I just wanted to um, bring to everyone's attention that last week at the CCCF meeting in Toronto, there was an ethicist from somewhere in the United States, uh, forgive me, I'll think of where it's from, um, who gave a whole 20-minute or 30-minute talk on exactly this question, on uh, sort of the ethics around withdrawing, withholding, stopping care on patients on ECMO, um, who may or may not be conscious, because a lot of patients are, of course, conscious and on ECMO. Um, and if it's meant to be a bridge to something else, then there is no bridge. Um, how do you handle that medically, legally, ethically? It was a very good session. Um, and I think that those that talk might be available online. Um, so just I just want to make that comment, because it was explored in depth, and it, it's a really a good point about someone who's clearly thought about it and written about this a lot. Thank you very much, Karen. Yeah, I, I would love to check that out. Because uh, again, I think those are, everyone gets very excited about the machines and the therapy, but I think this is as important, if not more important than that to consider in the context of those patients that will be taken care of. John, it's Paul Cameron. If I, I have another question. Um, <clears throat> converting this is maybe more niche, but converting femoral IJ to like an Avalon catheter to promote mobilization, waking up, uh, spontaneous breathing. Do you have a suggestion of how you would conceptualize making that transition? Like at what point would you consider it? Would you put, be putting an Avalon sort of or dual stage cannulas right away? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, and I'm noticing a lot of questions in the chat here as well. But uh, yeah, I think from a plumbing perspective, uh, for conversions, uh, you know, circuit changes can be dangerous. Uh, they can be associated with mortality. Cannulation changes can also be, you know, associated with adverse events as well. So I think you want a very strong motivation to be doing it. Uh, but again, like the sort of physiotherapy ambulation part of the critically ill can definitely be important. So it, it could very justifiably be a reason for doing so. Um, Often the access that you have established might be a contraindication to being able to switch over the circuit uh, to an Avalon cannula, but I've definitely seen it done. I've seen people that are on sort of ephemeral IJ cannulation strategy. They have a tracheostomy. They've shown some form of recovery. Place a uh, subclavian inserted dual lumen uh, veno venous ecmo catheter and just switch the tubes off of their femoral and IJ cannulation over to the dual lumen catheter remove the other two, uh, make sure that they have hemostasis, then the patients get up and start walking the next day. So it's definitely something that's possible, but I think ambulating an ECMO patient is uh, indicative of sort of like a higher level of care that ECMO centers can provide because not everyone is sort of capable or comfortable doing it. Um, even sometimes the concept of ambulating someone who's ventilated is, uh, you know, a challenge in, in certain uh, scenarios. So it's definitely possible to do um, as to your question, but it does require heroic concerted efforts on the behalf of physicians, allied healthcare team, respiratory therapists, perfusionists, physiotherapists to be able to do something like that. But if it's if, if we think that there's value, there's absolutely a technical possibility for achieving something like that. Um, Anton, I just wanna start going through some of these questions in the chat here, just I've noticed them accumulating. Yeah, we just um, have time for probably one more question here. Unfortunately, we have to stop at 1 p.m. Yeah, no, perfect. Uh, I think, um, yeah, a lot of great questions. Uh, so maybe I can briefly, Rachel, your question about how much it costs. Um, 
you know, ultimately the cost of disposables for one ECMO circuit uh, is around $10,000 to start. Um, if you look at the cost of a lot of things in intensive care, that's in line with a lot of the costs of machines that we use and things that we do on a daily basis, the consumables when it comes to taking care of patients is generally pretty much the same, uh, unless you need to start exchanging circuits or consider doing blood work more frequently or measuring sort of point of care, activated clotting time, those types of things. But generally it just starts to fall into the milieu of the sort of daily cost of taking care of a critically ill patient. Um, I think maybe just to answer Alex's question about, uh, you know, expanding LHSC's ECMO presence, uh, I think my sort of youthful enthusiasm in participating uh, as sort of a surgeon intensivist who is not a cardiac surgeon uh, is largely just to add sort of more manpower and investment in trying to evolve the current implementation that we have right now. And I think that involves a lot of focus on building education and simulation for our intensive care group uh, to help improve fluency and post cannulation management from our intensive care group. Um, and largely trying to make sure that we have slightly more autonomy of managing and adjusting and titrating ECMO as a therapy in concert with our perfusionists rather than sometimes exclusively relying on their advice. So I think helping move things forward in that regard uh, is sort of a main goal. And then also I think the having a physical presence at Victoria Hospital, I think will sort of expand the resources available to have multiple ECMO patients being treated at once. At, LHSC and the sort of, uh, you know, one hospital system, two sites model that we have, uh, especially when we consider in the middle of the last respiratory pandemic, we had the volume at one site uh, may have been helped by having more capacity and availability at a second site. Um, so I think those, among other things, are the goals that we have right now in terms of trying to develop and expand things further based on my involvement. Um, thanks again uh, for the opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and if anyone, uh, we've captured a couple of the questions and maybe we'll send those on via email to the people who are who asked them, uh, if we can get Dr. Lanner to weigh in. We really appreciate everybody contributing. We really appreciate all the excellent uh, interaction. That's very much what we want this to be about. Um, we will see you guys on January 25th, January 25th where Dr. DeRoche will be talking about updates in, in, diag in diagnosis and management of cardiogenic shock. And uh, thanks for another great session. Thank you, Dr. Landau. And here are the information for us. And hopefully you guys got the form in the chat. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you.